Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on digital heritage, active aging, and healthy community development. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you and our team of expert panelists, and I'm hoping that we will find it a very uh, productive and uh, rewarding session today. Uh, before we start, I would like just to do a little poll to uh, find out a kind of age uh, group grouping that people have got um, in today's webinar. So I'm launching a polling session and it's asking you uh, what age range you're in. So please select your age range. And we're getting the votes coming in and I'll be sharing that with you in a second. Okay, I'm ending the polling now um, and I will share the results with everyone. Uh, so you should see we don't have anybody under 20 and we've got a small minority under between 20 and 40. So the majority uh, of our viewers are over 40 years old. Uh, we've even got a couple of people who are over 81. So welcome all of you, whatever age range you are in. Um, and uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, uh, today. So I'm going to begin now by asking each of our um, uh, participants to uh, just uh, introduce themselves very briefly. And I'm going to begin with uh, Josie Fraser, who is uh, Head of Digital Policy at the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Uh, Josie, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Hi, thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me along to speak to everybody today. It's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Josie Fraser. Um, as you said, I'm the head of digital policy at the National Lottery Heritage Fund, where I've been in post since um, January. So it's been a, a kind of, I think, uh, maybe I've been in post in lockdown for about the same time at the moment as I've been in post pre-lockdown, not quite sure. Um, my maths has gone out of the window, to be honest, in the last couple of weeks. Um, before that, I was working at the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, leading on several um, digital policy strands. Um, and before that, I was head of ICT at Leicester City Council, supporting um, schools and education and uh, a whole range of different kind of um, tech strands. Um, but really happy to be in the heritage sector now and really happy to be here today. Thank you very much, Josie. I now move on to our global perspective uh, with uh, young Chris Blakey. Uh, uh, Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, Chris Blakey. Um, I started out my career really going into education and I've been in education and youth work nearly all of my life. Um, originally, it was to work with less able youngsters doing sport, um, particularly outdoor education, um, and infusing them with a passion for the outdoors, really, and helping them in that way to um, uh, gain a higher level of, of uh, personal confidence and move on into other things. Uh, after a period of time doing that myself, I started training teachers and instructors to do the same thing. Uh, so I have people around the world who are carrying on that good work. Um, and uh, then I had my own outdoor education centre in France, which was working with, again, it's a charity I set up, working with English and French children doing adventurous activities. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Chris. Uh, we move over to uh, uh, a local person, Jean Glanville, who lives in the next village to me, Jean. Hi, um, I came to Crafter Regis um, early 1999, and that's when the villagers were pulling together all their history um, that they've forgotten about. In, the purpose was to produce a book for the millennium. When I came here, I was a systems analyst working for um, a British hospitality company, and we were going to the, into the EPOS phase of uh, tills and back office systems for pubs and restaurants and hotels. Um, but I really started at the very beginning with um, technology, with punch cards and sorters and tabulators. Um, so I saw from the full gambit and uh, still learning things with Zoom and everything else that's going on. 
<laughs> Thanks very much for Jean. Yes, I remember punch cards. Uh, happy days, yes. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure our next um, uh, panelist, uh, Charlie Reese, he remembers punch cards as well. So Charlie, say a bit about yourself. Charlie Reese, I lived in Grafton Regis for the first 45 years of my life, but then I defected to the next village, Alderton, um, all very amicably. Um, basically an astrophysicist by degree, I didn't study history at, um, at, at even at O level, but um, I've, I've just been fascinated with it ever since. I started the project that Jean referred to in 1997 that produced a book on the history of Grafton, we did the CD ROM. I actually started the history walks as well, um, although without a costume, so it wasn't exciting. But now I've moved to Alderton, uh, where I own the Mount, which I'll talk about a bit later on, and I run the art festival in Alderton. So, um, exciting times. Okay, thanks very much for that, uh, Charlie. Now, uh, Kevin, um, tell us about your work in uh, in in Canada. Sorry, I I muted you by mistake. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, uh, I've certainly known uh, our, our colleague David here for seems like a hundred years now. Um, we uh, uh, <laughs> we've uh, we've both been in this uh, e-learning and uh, simulation-based learning and technology space uh, for uh, for a long time, and um, and, and I just see uh, tremendous opportunities overall for. Um, for folks in our uh, generation to um, to leverage and to you know use these kinds of technologies to um, uh, to promote and to uh, to make our lives perhaps a little richer as we uh, as we age. Uh, I'm really interested in that and also interested in how uh, technology can uh, enable us. Uh, to, to do things that we might not otherwise be able to do as we, uh, as we advance in age. Okay, thanks very much for that, uh, Kevin. Um, I'm now going to go back to uh, our, uh, the presentation um, and just run through the basic structure that we're gonna go through today. So we've had the, uh, the welcome and the introductions. Um, in a short while, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Josie Fraser, who's gonna tell us a little bit about uh, what her work involves in the um, uh, policy unit at the National Lottery Heritage Fund uh, before we move on to looking at one of the contexts of digital heritage and that is the use of digital technologies to capture and share modern day stories and bring communities together at a global level and to illustrate that um, I'll be asking Chris Blakey to take us on uh, his journey across Siberia in a 1932 Austin 7 and to talk about some of the people that he met and some of the communities that he met uh, and how it all helped to build bridges between two countries that normally aren't necessarily friends. And we move from the, glo from the global to the local then uh, to talk about the use of digital technologies to look at the past uh, and to celebrate local history, find ways of bringing communities together to appreciate and recognize all the heritage that is on everyone's doorstep and to use that as a kind of glue to bring communities together. Then we're going to look at international perspectives. Kevin McNulty is going to talk about uh, some of the opportunities, uh, some of the work that he's doing in Canada. Before we go into a panel discussion uh, with your questions and answers, uh, to look at digital heritage opportunities and challenges. Uh, what is the future going to look like? What are these opportunities and uh, challenges that we are all going to face over the next few years? Before I uh, go into introducing Josie Fraser, I'd just like to indulge myself slightly uh, by just sharing an experience that I had over 22 years ago. Um, today is very much like Groundhog Day for me because 22 years ago I was in a small digital media village, uh, a small digital media company uh, in a little rural village in Leicestershire Market near Market Harbour and I was fortunate enough to get some funding for a project designed to tackle some of the issues of globalisation. It was a project called Community Commerce and Knowledge Network 
And the basic concept is not too different from what we're talking about today is to how to encourage knowledge sharing and trading within communities so that they help to preserve the social and economic uh, wealth. So when I started this project, my idea was to recruit community champions, much like Charlie and, and Jean, uh, people who are using technology themselves and bring them together in a little community. And the way that I did this was to do a web search based on the name of my nearest town, which was Market Harbour. Um, bearing in mind, 22 years ago was in the very early days of the internet. And I came across this website called Big Fern. Uh, and it was a website which did pretty much 50% of what I just got the money to do. And what was worse from my point of view was that whoever designed this website was better at designing websites than we were. So I had a, com I had a competitor on my doorstep, better than me, um, and so I had a bit of moral dilemma. So anyway, I thought the world is big enough for both of us. So I, I sent an email to the webmaster and said, I've got some money for a project looking for people like you. Um, can you come and talk to me? So this guy arrived in my office one Friday afternoon. It's a moment I'll never forget. He walked through the door. I looked at him and I said, I'm sure I know you from somewhere. And he said, well, of course you do. I'm your milkman. And this, this was my milkman who in his spare time had taught himself to write HTML web pages and had built this community website from scratch without any training, he was completely self-trained. He even built his computer from spare parts. And my reaction was, this guy's on a different planet. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, but he was a great inspiration to me because what he taught me was that he was far from unique and that in every community around the world, there are remarkable people like this who find ways of using technology that those of us have been in, in the industry all our lives have never imagined. Uh, and so there's a, a great deal of credit um, uh, to my milkman from uh, Mar Mar Market Harbour uh, for this event today. So now I want to move on to, uh, uh, to the main event and go to uh, Josie. Uh, I'm going to spotlight you, Josie, because you're going to be uh, centre screen now and tell us about your work um, at the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Thanks very much. Um, so I was brought in in January as part of the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund's commitment to and understanding of the importance of digital to the sector. And there's a huge, huge uh, array of different ways in which uh, digital is um, really important to our sector, as it is to many others that I've not got the time to go into now. But obviously, in terms of things like um, increasing connections, building community, communicating, uh, providing educational resources, uh, increasing accessibility, supporting diversity in terms of participation, all of those things um, digital is really, really important for and, and can play a really key role. Additionally, obviously, digital skills, digital approaches, digital support can really help um, build organisational resilience and capacity and allow even very, very small organisations to punch way above their weight in terms of their visibility and their reach um, and in a, being able to really get across their own stories and their information um, as effectively or in a range of different ways as, as larger organisations can. So in many ways, digital is really important as a leveller. The, the ways in which, the many ways in which digital is important has just been really un, underwritten by our current situation where people are in lockdown and where digital is typically the only way that you can actually manage to keep in touch with your lo loved ones as well as your work community. Not saying anything about they never cross over those two realms, but I'm keeping it professional and putting them into separate boxes for the purposes of this talk. So, um, it's really important that we support the range of people who are in the situation now who may have well not been as well well prepared um, as other organisations prior to the lockdown. Um, 
and that's in terms of uh, infrastructure skills and all those kinds of uh, other kind of things that we we see a range of right across our sector and, and across other, many other sectors. So my policy remit, while it's quite broad and I'm interested in a whole range of different issues, so I'm interested in licensing, I'm interested in, in archiving, I'm interested in um, our in indigenous and minority languages, interested in a whole range of issues has really been focusing on skills and digital skills at the moment because that's a that's a kind of a critical key area for us and if you take a look at um, our website the National Lottery Heritage Fund website you'll see a few posts around digital at the moment one of which is um, talking about the range of um, opportunities we're offering um, to people working across the sector at the moment in upskilling uh, in a whole range of digital skills. And another more recent post is talking about the feedback we've been getting from the sector about the kinds of digital skills support that they're looking for at the moment or the new types of activity that they're engaging with. Really fascinating post. Um, please do go and uh, have a look at it. I think the headline things uh, to comment on here are just that, yes, um, things like communications and content creation do top those lists of people's kind of initial interests and concerns. But a lot of other things that you may not expect to um, appear on those lists are, um, are, are appearing already. So there's a huge amount of interest around working with communities online. So that's building communities online, the kind of techniques for doing that, working with vulnerable groups online, um, working with um, different um, types of um, uh, different types of communication online so including things like learning to create creating learning materials and carrying out consultations um, are appearing and also there's already a kind of a strand of um, strategic approaches and interest in that appearing so how do I as a small organization or medium organization or even as a large organization really take stock use this moment in time to take stock of how I deploy digital um, right across my organisation, what kinds of skills my staff or my volunteers have, how, uh, where do I want to um, target my kind of precious resource and time at the moment in, in terms of developing skills for specific reasons. So that's basically uh, the kind of um, thing that we're doing and to support that at the moment we're running a survey called the Dig Digital Attitudes and Skills for Heritage Survey. Really encourage anybody who's in an organisation of any ties in the, in the heritage sector to look that out and complete it because we're using that as a tool to support organisations as well as um, a way of us continuing to collect intelligence and uh, about the sector that will then go on to influence and direct um, our policy making and the kinds of activities and events that we provide. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Josie. Um, I'm now going to move over to uh, Chris Blakey. Um, just by words of a, a short introduction uh, to Chris, Chris and I went to the same school together. Uh, we went to Boston Grammar School, it's a good few years ago now. Um, and we both uh, gained a lot of our love of travel from an experience that we had in 1966 when we were fortunate enough to go on a school trip uh, to uh, Moscow and Leningrad. Um, and that's really the start of the story. So now I, I want to take, get uh, Chris to take it up from there uh, with the aid of a few uh, visuals to uh, uh, support the story. Uh, so we begin with um, the uh, enormity of the challenge that uh, Chris uh, gave himself to drive his 1932 uh, Austin 7 across Siberia. So Chris, what on earth possessed you to do such a thing? Well, as I said to um, um, a Russian television uh, star, why not really? Um, uh, Austin 7s have always been um, historically a, a simple car designed for the common man and uh, easier to repair uh, than uh, some of the older cars. And it just brought together two things that have interested me. One's travel and journeying. Three things, really. Um, uh, our own joint interest in Russia and rugby, which uh, was the Rugby World Cup in Tokyo. And I'd always wanted to go, and I thought, well, I'd bring all those things together and uh, drive there. 
Mm. Um, and to my knowledge, nobody else has ever done it. So it seemed like a good idea. Yeah. And it all goes to prove that uh, whatever age you are, um, you're still able to embark on adventures of this magnitude. Uh, so now we go to a picture of our school. Um, and this is uh, Chris's car that he went across Siberia in. And Chris is talking to a bunch of um, school children at the Boston Grammar School. Um, so what was your aim in, uh, what, was your, what were you trying to do uh, with these uh, school kids, Chris? Well, um, throughout my career, really, it's been in, in motivating people to make the most of their own lives. And part of that for me and for many other folk I've, I've met, it's been about having an adventurous spirit. And it's a matter of, it doesn't matter really whether it's in business or it's in uh, sport or whatever it may be. It's a, it's, a, it's a human trait that I think is very desirable. And, uh, you know, in my own little way, um, I've been trying to encourage people to make the most of their lives uh, in whatever they're doing and feel confident about doing that. And by showing that this happened when we were in Boston, when I was kind of 15, we went to uh, Russia when I was uh, 15. Um, and now I can return again, shows that you can carry on through life having adventures. Yeah, uh, I think that's very important. The intergenerational knowledge sharing and inspiration um, is going to be very important. Now, now we go actually to the, to the official start of your journey, which was at the Bewley annual Austin 7 uh, Motor Festival, which a lot of people of our generation got involved in. Do you want to say something about that, Chris? Um, yes, uh, the Austin 7 has always been very popular because um, in the world of classic cars, you, you can go from you know the, the very high end down to something like this, really, in a, as it was a, a, a pre-war classic, um, uh, the English equivalent of the Model T Ford. And because it's got such a great following and can be done on a reasonable budget, then they, there is sufficient uh, market there for people to be making parts and keeping parts and, um, and it keeps them going and keeps them on the road. Most of them, unfortunately now, of course, tend to stay in garages. Um, and my idea was to encourage new people, young people to take on Austin 7s by showing they can be a very practical and reliable car. Mm. Uh, and you mentioned keeping things on going and keeping things on the road. Of course, this applies to a lot of the people who look after the Austin Sodas themselves, isn't it? It's a, it's a hobby and a passion which they can, uh, which can enrich their lives. So now we've moved quickly on to a place called Porvu, uh, which is in uh, Finland. Um, and just tell very briefly uh, the story of the help that you got while you were in Porvu. Well... Um, unfortunately, I ran out of time doing the total kind of rebuild of the car and, you know, just took the view that, well, we'll sort it out when time allows. And I'd had several problems. One was a, a very badly uh, leaking uh, oil leak from uh, the petrol pump and it transpired, it wasn't the gasket, it transpired that the actual pump itself was cracked. And I put out a call on a thing called Austin 7 Friends and... Uh, Lo and behold, a little chap, a lovely man and his girlfriend in, um, in Finland picked that up and actually put a, took a, uh, an Austin 7 uh, petrol pump off his own car he was rebuilding and put it on a bus and sent it across Finland for me to pick up, which was absolutely amazing. And that's what I'm doing here, really, is working on that pump. Mm. So, so that, that's Paul Vu. Um, and then you went across the Russian border. You spent some time with uh, your, your wife and your son um, in St. Petersburg. And here we are now, Mr. Bond. How did you come to be James Bond? Um, I, was, I was contacting uh, various rugby clubs and I'd raised money to give uh, to the clubs for children's uh, rugby equipment. And when I contacted one of the clubs in Moscow, it transpired that uh, they were involved through a breakdown company in the largest classic car rally in Russia, which starts in Red Square and supported by Goom, uh, which is a large Harrods-like shop in Red Square. And uh, they said to me that they would help me with any breakdowns in the cities they represented if I would be kind of guest of honour at starting their rally. Through uh, through Moscow, and there we are. That's uh, 
And when I, when I arrived at the gate with no paperwork, I might add, I was accosted by police and security men uh, who looked at my registration plate and then said, good morning, Mr. Bond. I was then given the number 007. So I have to tell you that the Russians have got a sense of humour. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so Mr. Bond, uh, you, you set off uh, on this rally. Uh, enjoyed quite a lot of uh, hospitality whilst you were, were in Russia. Um, and you met some extraordinary people like the, um, uh, the monk here, was it Chebuk, Chebuk Sari? Uh, um, um, yeah, Chebuk Sari, and he's the, uh, he's the uh, it's, it's Russian Orthodox monastery. Um, and what a lovely man. And the reason I went there is um, I'd come across a chap who worked, uh, he was a friend of Ilya, who was on the other side, who was a Russian friend I met. And um, when we got to the particular uh, town, the gentleman who was the assistant mayor had spoken to the uh, the head of the monastery, and um, he uh, is a bishop, by the way, and uh, he happens to be French speaking, and I speak French as well, not Russian. And so we uh, we all went over there for a meeting, and he very kindly let me park the car overnight in his own personal garage. Uh, and he also gave you a traditional blessing by dousing you with uh, holy water. I both yeah, you and the, Ilya. <laughs> a slap in the mouth, yeah. Um, this is another remarkable story, um, that your involvement with the uh, the Russian military. Um, yep, came down one morning to find my car being inspected by people in uniform. And then after they, they'd all been brought to the attention, the, um, I was cheered because uh, it was a celebration going across Russia visiting cenotaphs to celebrate the end of the Second World War. And uh, obviously um, they were allies of ours and, and lost tremendously uh, more people than we did in the Second World War. And they were really, really kind. They, they decided they'd help me as best as they could. So. Um, on many occasions when we managed to meet up, they'd take the heavy kit out of the car and the spares to help me get up and down the mountains. And they would also stay with me and they would uh, allow me even to stay in army establishments at night sometimes. So that's part of your great hospitality. And this is one of your very special places, uh, Lake Baikal, uh, which I, is it the largest freshwater lake in it the is world? It is the largest freshwater lake in the world because of its depth which I can tell you is 1,642 metres, if you like that. Um, and I'm on a little plan at the moment with an ex-student of mine who builds wooden canoes. We're actually in the process of designing an, a wooden canoe. And uh, it's going to be called Lake Baikal. And I'm hoping to get into a joint project with some Russian youngsters, actually to canoe the length of it, which is about 400 miles. Oh, uh, another adventure to look forward to, Chris. Um, well, I, I couldn't find uh, the picture that I wanted, but uh, this is uh, from um, uh, Krasnoyarsk, uh, which is the home of the rugby club that uh, were part, instrumental in part of your trip. I think this is a really important picture, actually. I'm glad you've, you've chosen it. Many people, before I went, thought I was stupid, and many people thought I'd get into a lot of trouble. And au contraire, as they say, this is Krasnoyarsk and walking down the boulevards of Krasnoyarsk at night, I can tell you, is as lovely as it is walking through Paris. All the bridges are lit up. There's live music and there's bands and there's children and there's bars. And uh, it's, it, it was a lovely, lovely place. And I was completely blown away by it, really. And as I was by nearly all of the cities that I went to, across uh, 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 eastern Russia and Siberia. Mm. And of course, um, many of the people in these places you visited uh, will not have seen an English person in their lives. Uh, so... um, uh, to, to many of the people, to be honest, I mean, it's one of the things I wanted to raise, was hardly anyone goes there on holiday anyway. Um, there are obvious business connections, um, and there are people who take the Trans-Siberian Railway but their chance of actually meeting the cross-section of the society that I met traveling very slowly and breaking down fairly regularly um, is limited. So I thought I was privileged, really, through the, 
through the use of babushka, as we call her now, um, as as a as a, a key to the door to opening up my ability to actually meet real Russian people and make my own decision about what it's like to be there. Mm. And of course, well, you told this story the other day of, of all the help that you had when your wheel came off uh, and the rush, bad, very bad Russian roads. I won't go into that again now, but suffice it to say, you had a, a senior person in a nearby city help to organize and work through the night to uh, get that wheel put back on your car so that you could continue your journey. Just a, another example of the remarkable help that you got over there. Uh, so that eventually brings us to uh, Vladivostok uh, and you having a paddle in the sea. So who is the lady with you, uh, Chris? Well, I, this is, her name's Jude and um, I never knew her. And uh, I just received an email saying she's heard I was doing the trip. And she wanted to get to Tokyo for a party. Um, and um, she was of an adventurous nature. And if I had a spare seat, would I take her along? And I didn't know the lady, but when I quizzed her quite deeply about it, because it's not everyone's cup of tea to sleep in the woods with bears, um, she uh, announced that she was the first English lady to actually cycle single-handed around the world. So I thought... <laughs> That's fair enough, then. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't really uh, can't really top that. Uh, of course, here is Babushka against the uh, uh, background of the I iconic um, Mount Fuji. That's part of one of the the photo shoots and the regular media opportunities that Babushka uh, created for you. And at the end of the journey, of course, you were a guest of the Russian uh, Rugby Federation at the World Cup opening ceremony. So. Yeah, well, it, it, it's, it's quite a story. Um, uh, and the thing that you brought over to me that you wanted to let everybody know is to not make judgments about people based on what you might read in the media, is that, that communities of ordinary people around the world are all ready to put themselves out in situations uh, like you found yourself in. So you had an enormous amount of, of help during the time that you were over there, didn't you? Yeah, fantastic. Absolutely first class. Yeah. Uh, so thanks very much for that, Chris. I, I want to uh, move on now um, and uh, bring in um, Jean Glanville. Uh, she is the, the lady who makes the costumes uh, the, uh, for the, um, uh, the history walks. Um, so what I'm going to do with, uh, with Jean is that I'm going to uh, get Jean to help me narrate this virtual tour of um, our beautiful historic Grafton region. So uh, this is a virtual tour, which will be available on, on the internet. Uh, I want to do a quick whistle -top stop tour to highlight some of the, uh, some of the points about the, the village and where it is. Well, Grafton Regis is a tiny little village. Uh, it's uh, between Milton Keynes, as you can see in the south, um, and Northampton in the north. Uh, I'm going to take you straight over to the village hall, uh, which is where the history walks uh, that Charlie mentioned earlier on take place. So here we are on one of the history walks, and you can see there's quite a good audience there, and we've got local people dressed in costumes. So a gentleman called Keith Harry uh, playing one of the characters there. And I'll just ask Jean say a little bit about the stories behind some of the paintings. So if we start on the left-hand side there, what's this uh, picture about, uh, Jean, Henry VIII? Okay, this is Henry VIII at Grafton Manor, which was one of his holiday homes. Um, he's there with Anne Boleyn, and Cardinal Wolsey and Cam Cardinal Campeggio had come back from Rome to tell him that he couldn't have a divorce. Um, so when you see these um, stories on TV productions and what have you, and they're in London, in one of the palaces there, they weren't. They were at Grafton Regis. So uh, King Henry VIII, uh, you could uh, legitimately argue, I think, that uh, this was really the birth of the um, uh, Church of England. Uh, that's what we like to say. That's what we like to say, because he was so disenamored with the Catholic Church, so he decided to set up his own church so he could have a divorce. Um, and this picture here, the Queen's Oak meeting. Right, this is Elizabeth Woodville and Edward IV. Um, 
over on the other, the other side of the village were, were um, big hunting forests and Edward IV was over there hunting. Elizabeth Woodville's first husband um, had been killed in the Second Battle of St Albans. He was a Lancastrian um, and Elizabeth Woodville's um, um, mother-in-law had said her children couldn't inherit the estate um, because she was still of a, um, an age to have more children. So Elizabeth came home, she heard Edward was over hunting, she went across to the forest and pleaded for her land. Um, she's supposed to be a very beautiful lady, he was quite enamoured and he was a bit of a, um, a ladies man anyway, um, but she played him along and he eventually married her. Yeah, uh, so we go back now to the aerial view, There's, there, there are more things within this building, but you will have noticed that uh, these history walks are very popular, particularly with the, uh, with the older generation. So now we go to uh, the local church, and by, by the way, beside it is the manor house. So you can, this is the manor house where uh, uh, King Henry VIII uh, used to spend the weekends with, uh, with Anne Boleyn. Uh, but this church, St. Mary the Virgin, uh, also has a history of its own, and I couldn't help, as uh, Josie is in the room, just to, uh, just to make the point that um, you have been a beneficiary of uh, Heritage Lottery funding for some of the work within the church, uh, and this is uh, some of the ways in which the money has been spent. Um, and so what we see here is uh, a display with the costumes that you were responsible for, uh, for making, uh, uh, Jean. Uh, this is Henry VIII. Uh, just one other thing is, is the, the fact that um, Grafton Regis is not just uh, linked to King Henry VIII. On, on, the, um, on the wall here is there is a, a plaque to Admiral Fitzroy, who, was, uh, who, was, who captained the Beagle uh, when Charles Darwin went over to Australia. Uh, and he was also the person who set up the Royal Meteorological uh, Society. So he had a lot of involvement in meteorology, uh, the meteorology that we know today. Uh, at the back of the church at the moment is a very famous uh, tune. It's one of, uh, uh, one of the top 100 one. Um, just say a little bit about that, Jean. Yes, this is um, Elizabeth Woodville's great-grandfather. The tomb was originally at the front of the church and the Victorians gradually moved it down into a corner um, at the back here where it suffers from damp and this was all part of the reason why we've got the Heritage Lottery Grant. Um, the tower roof needed replacing um, um, so we had to work out a project that would help the tomb as well as do a necessary repair. Um, this is now we have a new floor in the tower for the bell ringers and we get we have this lovely window and the view into the church. The plan is um, to move on our next project stage. This one is just about finished. The next project stage is to restore the uh, the Woodville tomb and the other medieval tomb next to it and move them back to what is currently the vestry area at the front end front end of the church. So it's still a work in progress, uh, but we. Uh, very grateful uh, for the support that uh, you've had from the Heritage uh, Lottery Fund. Uh, so yeah. now I'm going to quickly go over to the village where, where I uh, happen to live. Uh, and you can see some of the things that have been mentioned uh, in Jean's story. Uh, there's the Queen's Oak site where Edward IV was uh, supposed to have met um, uh, Elizabeth Woodville. Um, going over to Alton Village, very quickly, we have an aerial view. Uh, my house is um, just up, up in the top corner there, um, but enough of that. Charlie owns the, the mount, and I'll just ask him very briefly to say a little bit about uh, the mount, Charlie. I'm going to bring you uh, on screen, just bear, bear with me a second. I need to find you first. Okay, Charlie, can you tell us about the mount? Yes, it's a medieval ringwork castle, um, one of 200 uh, left in, in the country, and it goes back to the early 12th century. It was um, given by William the Conqueror to his half-brother, um, Robert Count of Mortain, 
and he owned something like 99 manors in Northamptonshire out of a total of 793. And I think the, um, the Times did a, a rich list of all the people that lived since 1066, and he came third in, in, the, um, um, in, that, in the millennium after 1066, third richest man. Now the castle was um, excavated by, well not excavated, but it dis, um, investigated by, by time team. And at the time they, they, they produced these sort of drawings that you can see on the, uh, on the uh, picture now. Um, but they feature wooden buildings. Now the owner of the mount, before I bought it, he did some further archeology. span And in fact, there were stone buildings with glass um, on, on the site. So they were quite prestigious buildings, but it, it, it was only occupied until about the 40s. So that's uh, history of the mount. And uh, 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 Charlie is the owner of that now, or as he described to me yesterday, it owns him. Um, and so we go now to our uh, local church, um, the Church of uh, St. Margaret in, uh, in Alderton. Um, and there is a figure at the end there, Charlie. Did say very briefly? Yes, yeah, it's a wooden effigy um, of, we believe, Robert, um, Count of Mortain. Sorry, Sir William Coomber Martin, I do apologise. Um, he died about 1318. And uh, so this is um, a nice... Nice empty, quite red, but it's it would have been originally painted, um, and we think it was painted red, white, and gold. So it'd be lovely to, um, to I think at some point, um, come up with a um, a model of, of, of what this looked like, you know, recreate a model in its in its full color and mount it properly. Okay, thanks very much for that, uh, Charlie. Um, we now I want to move on to uh, to Kevin. Um, so we can get an international perspective from Kevin to talk about some of some of the things that are happening in Canada. Hi, Kevin. Hi, folks. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Great. Um, yeah. So some interesting. First of all, I'm uh, I'm actually a, a Belfast boy. Uh, we emigrated to to uh, to Quebec in Canada, and of course. Um, Growing up uh, in Quebec and speaking Quebec French with a Belfast accent used to get me beat up, <laughs> as you can imagine. So, uh, so here I am today. But uh, yeah, so interesting things happening here, uh, uh, and it's it's kind of interesting that that our generation, I think most of us uh, are are uh, in this uh, generation, um, are faced with some really interesting opportunities because um, we have technology that's, that's uh, enabling us to do all kinds of things that, that previous generations uh, didn't have available. And, and for instance, this uh, online technology and, and, uh, and um, while technology in and of itself is not a, is not any kind of a silver bullet for enriching lives. It's uh, it is an enabler, and and it can uh, empower people. And and uh, this very thing, the opportunity to share uh, stories and share uh, history, and uh, and even uh, being uh, retired or semi-retired, as as the case may be, allows us to uh, explore. Uh, a, a lot of opportunity, a lot of uh, knowledge. Uh, maybe it's uh, learning new languages, learning history. I mean, uh, we come from, we all come from a, a, a very uh, rich heritage. Um, where, wherever we live in the world, uh, we we have uh, uh, we have a, a tremendously rich um, heritage. That's uh, that's quite frankly uh, even further enriched. Uh, by technology, uh, by the opportunity to, uh, to to research history, for example, um, and so uh, as we uh, as we age, uh, we have some um, great opportunities. It, it, it uh, there's a, a Bertrand Russell quote, and uh, he once said, "Make your interests gradually wider and more impersonal." until bit by bit the walls of the ego recede and your life becomes increasingly merged in the universal life. And so, you know, to me that what that says is that, uh, you know, we have uh, 
uh, in the 21st century an opportunity to really stretch in our retirement, stretch our, our, our mental capacity uh, and our physical capacity. Nothing beats a walk in the woods, of course, but um, uh, if you are in some way um, constrained physically by, you know, uh, health conditions, um, you know, uh, wearables, technology can perhaps uh, allow you to take that walk in the woods uh, with some degree of confidence because now you, uh, you have, you know, uh, be it uh, a, a heart rate monitor, a, a oxygen monitor, these and that. So um, I, I, I see technology as being a, a tremendous resource to enrich our lives as as we age okay thank you very much for that uh kevin uh so now i'm going to go back to the gallery view um and i want to put a question to all of our panelists and that is to ask them what they see as being the main challenges and opportunities as we come out of uh, covid19 and how can uh, heritage and uh, the older uh, society um, help to regenerate uh, local uh, communities. How important is that going to be for the future? Uh, can I start with you, uh, Josie? What's your views on that? Um, as, as you'd expect me to say, very important, <laughs> I think, uh, being, able to, um, being able to engage digitally is is a sign of kind of inclusion in in the modern world. Um, we we have the whole we have a whole area of concern around digital exclusion, um, and we have um, a lot of work going on to seeing how we can support um, bringing lots of different groups who are unable to um, use technology for a, a wide range of different reasons. Um, into that fold so to not be able to um to not to lack the confidence and the and the ability and the access to technology is actually has actually become a marker of social exclusion so um it, it is fundamental that people of all ages um and all kinds uh, are given the opportunity and supported to be able to use technology as effectively as possible um, obviously, we're doing our bit in terms of in terms of our program. Um, many other organisations are are also doing work in this area too. Um, so I think there are increasing opportunities for people as well now, which is great to actually get kinds of support and and see the kinds of examples as well of things that they need to spark their own kind of imaginations and creativity about how best yeah. to. On, on that point, um, did, have you seen uh, encouraging signs uh, really as a result of COVID-19 of people that were separated from the families having to find ways to entertain themselves, to connect to their loved ones? Have you seen uh, a lot of examples of innovation really that's been a result of the lockdown? Yeah, and I think a lot of that innovation has been on a very human level too. It's about how do you keep yourself and your family entertained for eight weeks when you can't actually um, do the kinds of activity, a lot of the kinds of activities that you've previously enjoyed. So I think it's been a, a huge, um, a huge uh, wave of, of kind of localised creativity. In terms of the cultural sector, yes, you see lots and lots of engagement with um, technology going on and lots of new approaches being attempted, which is fantastic. Um, I, I think as well, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be post lockdown, we're going to be in a very different landscape in terms of people's attitudes and, and, and willingness to embrace technology um, to the one that we're in now. Um, and, you know, I think previously some people have had a kind of a little bit of a barrier because they've seen tech as a, a purely geeky thing. And I'm not... Um, I'm not saying anything against geeks because I think they're amazing. I think we really need them. But some people have been put off because they've seen the technology domain as belonging to a particular kind of group of people rather than something that's accessible to everybody that helps everybody get on with their day-to-day -day lives and be um, more creative and, and connect more, which I think, and I think that's significantly changed mm. um, during the current situation. 
So, yeah, I, I think I'd agree with you there. Um, and now, Chris, he's always, Chris has just often described himself as a bit of a technophobe. And, uh, um, well, I won't use some of the phrases that he used, but uh, I think you were doing yourself, <laughs> you, you're doing yourself a bit of an injustice there, uh, Chris. So um, did the experience of going across Siberia, you know, before we, you set off, uh, we set you up with a GoPro fastened to your car, um, and so did the experience of driving uh, across Siberia give you a new insight into how you could use technology to share your experience? Yes, very much so. Um, the GoPro, unfortunately, just wasn't a practical piece of kit because uh, it, it needed me to be able to download it to my phone and then get Wi-Fi to send it back, um, unfortunately. But... Um, because their internet connection and their, their wonderful system across Russia, I, I, I used to get a better signal in the middle of Siberia when I hadn't seen anyone for three days than I do living in Corsham near Bath. Um, so I don't know how they do that. It's all <laughs> smoke and mirrors uh, as far as I can see. Um, but, um, and the fact that uh, to get one of their SIM cards to have one month of internet and uh, as many downloads as you like across Russia cost five pounds, which I thought was rather lovely. Um, I, the only thing I couldn't do on that card was I couldn't uh, phone outside of Russia, but I could do that with my other SIM card. So yeah, the technology um, is fantastic. And I mean, what it's doing is making the world less polluted i think because people are learning to use this technology in such a way as you guys are which has got to be a good thing in terms of global warming and it's building bridges between societies which have, are really really important and i mean i learned that because people before i went thought i was completely mad and some people were going to join me and they they backed out because they were frightened of what might happen in russia and I'm now able to, you know, give a very good first-hand um, uh, uh, story about that, which wouldn't be possible necessarily without what we've been able to do on the internet and you've been able to do with the videos. So, yeah, I mean, the future is good. I think it's fantastic. And it's not everybody, of course, you didn't mention this, it's not everybody who has a spot on primetime Russian television after Vladimir Putin as your new story uh, uh, made, made the headlines. So uh, that's uh, quite an achievement. And also when you arrived in Japan, you found yourself on primetime television uh, in Japan with a, a television crew waiting to welcome you off the boat. Uh, so it just shows how technology can help the word uh, spread from, uh, from country to country. Charlie, what's your views on um, uh, the use of technology? Because I'd, I rather unkindly described you as a technophobe when I spoke to you the other day, but uh, after seeing your skilled use of uh, Zoom yesterday, I I take it all back. So, you know, so are you now a fan of technology? Oh, yes. Yes, I have been. Um, I haven't always mastered it very well. But um, so this year, with, with COVID-19, this will be the first time in Oldham that we can't hold our annual um, art festival. And this is, it raises £6,000 a year for the church. We, we have no village hall. We don't even have a pub in Alberton. So the church is crucial. So um, what we're thinking of doing now is maybe having an online um, painting sale, which could, could be much broader, a bigger, wider audience. And, and who knows, bring in the same, same sort of amount of money that we've, we've had before. Um, the... It's interesting with, with having um, Curtis Lottery Fund uh, um, uh, money available um, in Grafton. Um, we'd like to do something similar in, in Alberton because we, we need toilets in the, in the church to help with the social functions. Um, but also the mount, you know, that's crying out for some, um, some repair work on the staircase. And also there's a, a beautiful stone wall that's fallen down. If we could get volunteers under supervision to rebuild that with some funding, that would really enhance the village and then bring the, the, the village together again. 
Mm. Well, I, I will I will hand over the begging bowl to Josie later on, Charlie. So <laughs> that was a, a good pitch. Good try, Charlie. Uh, so, Jean, uh, well, you have a technology background, which I found quite surprising, um, uh, working uh, for Whitbread and helping to install EPOS systems in pubs ar around the country. So you're already well skilled with technology. Yeah, one, of, one of the things we found with... Um, rolling out the EPOS tills, we had to test everything thoroughly with the pub managers and the staff. And when we wrote user manuals, it had to be very simple, no techie phrases, so that anybody could pick it up and understand it straight away. Mm. Um, and we like Charlie, we depend on visitors for our funding for the church and the village hall. Uh, we can't do the walks and talks, which bring in most of our funding. Uh, we have quite a few overseas visitors because of the Woodville connection and the Fitzroy's. Um, they come from Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Sierra Leone, and it's amazing uh, where they come from. I, the church is open every day when we're allowed, and I go in the church, look at the visitors book, and sort of go, oh, fancy coming from there to come see us. Um, but we're building a new website, and we've got to make sure that we attract those people to us through the website if they can't visit. Hmm. Well, Chris, you, you reminded me when you were talking about the quality of the internet, and Jean just reminded me also, uh, that uh, that picture that I showed of the history walk with, uh, with, with Keith Harry didn't actually see me in shop, but uh, I'm actually in the room holding a selfie stick with a 360-degree camera. Right. Um, and even in this little village hall in a quiet corner of England with 4G mobile, I was able to stream a 360 degree uh, video to the rest of the, the world, uh, as well as recording it and posting it to YouTube. And that video, where, where, when it was streamed, it was watched in uh, Thailand, in Brazil, and in Lithuania. Uh, so you never know who... Uh, we'll find out about English history through some of the technologies that we uh, that we use. So, Kevin, uh, over, over to you. What do you see as the opportunity and uh, challenges? Mute. Uh, ah, need to unmute you, uh, Kevin. You're muted. How's ah, that? That's it. That's better. Yeah. Great. Uh, so uh, to, um, uh, to Josie's point, um, the, I think the single biggest challenge is just uh, that uh, some folks uh, are excluded from technology through, you know, whether it be attitude or, or, or uh, access. Uh, uh, but, uh, and I think we have a, I think it's important that we provide access to technology for folks that want it. Some folks aren't interested and that's fine. But uh, having access to the technology uh, allows folks, uh, to, to Gene's point around, for instance, making the, you know, the church and the history uh, uh, accessible through the internet. I think you know, that's, that's really important. Uh, I, I think there, there's opportunities for people who might not be able to travel uh, to be able to uh, enjoy uh, all of these, the richness of our, of our human heritage uh, through technology, be it a, you know, a, a tour of uh, a virtual tour of a museum, uh, some of the, uh, you know, terrific uh, virtual 360 stuff that, uh, that you've been doing, David, uh, is, is, uh, is something that, you know, provides an opportunity for people to enrich their lives. And, and as we, uh, as we age, uh, and uh, and also uh, in this uh, post-pandemic world, I, I I expect to see a, perhaps a change in attitude towards technology. Uh, I think a, a new appreciation of technology, and um, and beyond just the uh, uh, the learning component, um, you know, and, and access to be it uh, museums or, or art or this or that, uh, you know. I see tremendous opportunities for folks, even with health uh, concerns, to be able to go for that walk in the woods who might not 
otherwise be able to, but now with, uh, with wearable technologies that can monitor their uh, oxygen rates, their, their, um, uh, their uh, uh, heart rates, uh, you know, blood pressure, this and that, uh, and also be able to uh, uh, access emergency uh, health uh, emergency responders uh, through their technology so that they can go for that walk in the woods where they might not otherwise be able to. So um, I, I, we're, I think technology opens up uh, a, a lot of opportunities for us as we, as we grow older. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for that, Kevin. I'm conscious of time and I, I'm just going through the chat to see if there's any questions that have been raised and nothing in the Q and a, uh, we did have somebody from, uh, from Tokyo, uh, with us today, uh, Yasuhiko Kawasumi, uh, which is all good evening. Um, he says, uh, to Chris, what a wonderful journey. Didn't you use a sledge in Siberia when you're in winter time? Um, some people got to go back to work. Uh, my friend, Tim Forsman, who near, lives near Baltimore, um, he was uh, asking who was the valedictorian at Boston Grammar School? So who is, who is this? Chris, do you know the answer to that? I don't, even, I, don't, I don't even know what a valedictorian is. I can't even spell it. I'm not exactly. So <laughs> they really asked the wrong, uh, the wrong person. Um, a comment from uh, Reza Jafari uh, saying the aging population could be a great resource for workforce development and idea exchange. The new generation of innovators and leaders it could be a great transitional initiative for the digital transformation of our society. Um, and Reza Jafari is former group president of HP for global telecom uh, and media entertainment industries. Uh, we've had some thank yous from uh, from people for an interesting uh, webinar. Um, oh, I think uh, the point that my friend Tim was making that uh, neither uh, Chris nor myself ever got to be a head boy at school. So <laughs> there you are. You don't you don't have to succeed very early in life to uh, uh, to carry on trying for the rest of your life. Well. We're now really at the end of the time. I just want to ask each of our panelists in turn just to uh, say a few closing remarks, any observation they've got to uh, want to make um, before, we, uh, before we close down. So, so Josie. Hi, thank you ever so much. Um, well, thanks for inviting me. I've had a really enjoyable um, afternoon listening to everybody's stories um, and seeing what everybody's up to. So thank you for that. Um, all I'd say is that, you know, regardless of how confident you've previously felt about using technology, either personally or with your organization or with your group, now is the best time to get started because there's lots of people in the same boat. There's lots of people who, you know, um, are willing to help out or are on the same journey as you are. So it's a really, really great time to start thinking about those digital projects that you've always kind of had at the back of your mind or to start to explore about how you can really get the most out of digital to capture and, and let other people into your own stories. Like, like today, we're all here today because of the marvels of technology and because you know people have been confident enough to step up and take part and pitch in um so yeah please do do take advantage of the current mood um, and enthusiasm thank you very much for that uh, josie chris yes well i mean i think the same thing really because uh whilst i'm i'm not uh, up on the uh, technology of it all I'm a user of it, and I think I've proven that it can bring people together. And I think that in our present crisis and also with the global warming crisis and uh, you know, trying to keep peace in the world, anything that helps us to uh, spread the word that most people in the world are nice and they uh, uh, want to uh, make the world a better place, um, if the technology does that, that's got to be uh, grasped with both hands. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Jean, wise words from you, Jean. Oh, wise words from me. Really, um, we, as you know, we're doing our church services um, through Zoom. Um, I know it took some of the people quite a time to get used to it. So all I would say to all these developers is keep it simple. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, talking of keeping it simple, Charlie. Am I unmuted? 
No, um, you are. Yep, you are. Yep. I just had a look down the, the list of attendees. I think Rob Westlake is, is on. I just want to thank Rob. He did a, a very important survey of the mouth for me. Thank you, Rob. Um, can I just leave you with a greeting? Because Keith Harry um, has been a good friend of mine. He's on as well. But I always misquote Shakespeare and say, God cry, Keith Harry, England, and St. George. <laughs> Absolutely. Amen. For, amen to that. Yeah. Uh, okay, Kevin, you've got the, the last word uh, before me. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, again, to kind of reiterate, I think this, this pandemic has given a whole new uh, meaning and appreciation for online technologies and technology in general. And, uh, and uh, I think it's really great uh, to hear what, uh, what all of these panelists have been doing uh, to uh, enrich the lives of, uh, of, of uh, the people in their communities. And, and uh, I think this is great. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, let's all continue to do this. And, uh, and David, uh, especially uh, you, thank you for, uh, for presenting this and organizing this and, and, uh, and bringing people together. Because to, to Charlie's point, uh, communication is, is the key to... Um, to overcoming some of these, uh, uh, this polarization that we're seeing in, in the world today and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and sharing our stories and sharing our wisdom uh, and sharing uh, all of the, uh, 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 all of the, uh, the richness that, uh, that we have to, uh, to offer and, and make our lives better. Uh, thank you. Well, Keith Harris actually raised his hand, uh, so I'm going to let him talk. So, uh, I don't know whether you'll come on the screen. Um, uh, Keith, whether you, you can unmute yourself and uh, 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 speak to us. Hello, David. I'm afraid that was a complete misuse of technology, actually. I just meant to acknowledge Charlie's greeting. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everybody, anyway. Really enjoyed it. And, uh, well, we'll see what happens subsequently. Yeah, with Josie. Well, yeah, thank you for that, Keith. And also thank you for all of your uh, characterization in the history walks and all of your help and support along with Gene and many others for the, uh, the regular old folks luncheons that we uh, used to have at uh, Grafton Regis Village Hall, enjoyed by all parties and hopefully we'll resume with social distancing at some time in the future. So for now, uh, thank you to one and all, both for our expert panellists and also uh, for our participants for joining us today. Uh, this event has been recorded, so for those who missed it or missed part of it, you will be able to see it at some point in the future <clears throat> uh, online via YouTube and via uh, my, uh, my, my website. So thank you once again and uh, bye. Bye, bye to everyone. Bye.